I'm uh, Chris Sawyer Lozano. I'm one of the organizers, I guess, uh, of this event. The book of nearly 700 pages knocked me out. I spent my late childhood and teenage years in Mexico and returned there year after year. I was familiar with some of the poets, but most were discoveries. I devoured them. Another discovery was the editor. This was the first time I had come across Monica's name. She intrigued me. She was a Mexican poet, yes, but a Mexican poet writing in English and who lived in North America, not Mexico. I think it's safe to say that she is a poet of the Americas. Some of her poems reflect the Mexican experience, and yet they push way beyond any national boundary. Google tells me that Monica de la Torre was born and raised in Mexico City, earned a BA from the Instituto Tecnológico Autónomo de México, and with the support of a Fulbright scholarship relocated to New York in 1993 to pursue an MFA and a PhD in Spanish literature at Columbia. The poetry collections include public domain, talk shows, or and they have the end all welcome. She teaches a brand. How I see her work with language, with transnationality. After I read the Versible Monuments, I came across her 2008 collection, Public Domain. In this unique book, Monica focused thematically on language learners and public speaking. But the real subject is communication and our experience of it. Through a variety of forceful syntactical devices, she rearranges experience and the experience of language. We end up wondering, how do we really communicate? And maybe even why we communicate. And then there's the happy end, all welcome, which is a response to a New York art installation by Martin Kippenberger, entitled The Happy End of Franz Gaffer's America. It's an amazing book that picks up on Kafka's absurd giant job fair held by the Nature Theater of Oklahoma. It's also about place, time, and furniture. Yes, furniture. She masterfully places one direct statement after another, after another, but each time the statement changes. And so does our awareness of language, of thought, of what meaning is and isn't. I want to close and welcome her with a few lines in the poem, Positions Available. They seem fitting as a way of introducing her and as a way of introducing you to her. Anyone thinking of their future belongs in our midst. Anyone thinking of their future, your place is with us. And we congratulate you here and now those who have decided in our favor. If you decide to join us, we congratulate you here and now. Is at its peak. 
Are these words enough to drag the real into the poem? To feel buoyant, all I need to do is not to get in the light's way. I'm in transit, en route to New York, translating myself, we could say, in the geometrical sense. The more I write to you now, the more I'm missing seeing the landscape sleep by. I don't have something to say to you at this time. I'll return to you once the sun has gone down. Yours, Monica. P.S. I've been commuting to Providence for over a year, and until now, I did not get why C.D. Wright sold me on the prospect of being able to do some writing on the train. I've been sitting in the wrong car all these days, all these months. The quiet car, where I automatically turn myself into a cop, policing people's loud typing and cell phone use. <laughs> Do you not know that they're sitting in the quiet car? It should be library silent. Don't they get it? And aside, soy una tumba, I am a grave, is the Spanish idiom for my lips are sealed. I just taught David Anton's talking. The introduction has a quote from Anton's essay on Wittgenstein, in which he relates how the philosopher stopped lecturing from notes because the words look like corpses when he began to read them. Well, it enough that you don't need to get dizzy or have to pull all, put all your energy into preventing your laptop from sliding from the tray table. You can even look out the window as you type. And since there are no seats compartmentalizing the views further, what you get is expansive, sweeping, glorious. PPS. Okay, one more thing before I let you keep resting, peacefully, I hope. I adore your notion of single poems not bound to longer sequences or book projects as one night stands. Monogamy is so hardwired into me, it even regulates my rating. One-offs of all kinds I find too unsettling. That might be the reason why instead of taking the southbound train earlier today, I got on the one to Boston. I was in a daze all morning, since walk waking from a dream in which I was about to have an affair with someone who was very handsome and hyper-masculine. In real life, I've never met him. Unexamined masculinity I find disconcerting, but what I mo was most startled by in the dream was the intensity of feeling. Is that how you felt about Gorka? I would have fallen in love with him too had not, not, had not so many others done so already. I'm more of a cult person. Popularity kind of turns me off. Too predictable. I mean, here I am in the cafe car speaking to the dead. After I asked the conductor if I was on the wrong train earlier this afternoon, a man turned to me and said, my worst nightmare. <laughs> Maybe you're in a dream. Maybe all of us here are in your dream. I'm back on track now. Bye for now. Oh, and thank you for reminding me that different types of love are possible. Dear Jack, I love looking at people looking out the window lost in thought. It gives you a sense of their interiority. Letters do the same. Take the guy a few tables down. He looks so wistful. He goes from his computer screen to gazing out onto the ocean. This train route follows the shoreline. I wonder if he's reading about the most recent mass shooting. I couldn't get myself to read the news about it. I feel more outraged than empathy. I want to say I'm starting to become immune, but that realize it's been a gradual, steady progression towards not sympathizing. We get what we deserve is what I think never thinking myself part of that we, which is peculiar and complicated. I told you I might keep getting heavy if I go on writing. Best to go on listening to Radiohead's present tense instead. Don't get heavy, keep it light, and keep it moving. It's my self-defense against the present. I'm channeling the lyrics, by the way. What kind of music did you like? In this, you're like the people around you listening to something privately, in public. What they're hearing, literally, in their heads, is nothing but a complete mystery to the rest. Unless they're blasting the music and their earbuds leak sound. P.S. I thought you'd appreciate knowing that I just passed the mystic shipyard. Rocks are beautiful in their resistance to narrative. I just saw a swan. Jack, hi again. In your correspondence to Lorca, you mentioned a letter you couldn't finish. You write, you were like a friend in a distant city to whom I suddenly was unable to write because I was suddenly, temporarily, not in the fabric of my life. If I'm responding to the letters Lorca wasn't able to reply to himself, why am I not writing this in Spanish? I doubt he would have chosen to write to you in English. Apropos of friendship, did you know that fabric and fabrica are false friends? <laughs> fabric is tela and fabrica is a factory where things are fabricated, manufactured. 
It almost seems like you knew this when writing elsewhere, nothing matters except the big lie of the personal, the lie in which these objects do not believe. Love from the fabrica of my life fabric, M. Hello again, Jack. More than an hour has gone by. The sun hasn't gone, gone down fully yet. There's a heavy swath of gray descending upon a ring of glowing orange. I'm now in Bridgeport, where the landscape has turned industrial. I need your words now, so much less than you need mine. Regarding reciprocity, I wonder if you looked for signs that could be interpreted as Lorca's posthumous responses to your letters. Did you think he'd send you signals from beyond the grave? Now, there's a troubled phrase, especially in this case, since the search for Lorca's remains continues. Forgive me, please. I see embers in the sky, splotches of iridescent orange pink amid the gray. I look up again, but they're gone. How quickly it goes dark. Love to you, M. P.S. Chitra, whom I've known since before 9-11, got on the train in New Haven. As it turns out, she studied with CD as an undergrad. At the time, she fantasized about becoming a poet, but she became a visual artist instead. Her voice warmed up when mentioning CD. What if she were here with us now in the cafe car? PPS, another odd coincidence. The woman with bright blue nail polish and two cell phones who was sitting across from me leaves. And now a new person has taken her seat. He too lays two cell phones on the table. CD, Jack, are you trying to tell me something? Like you, Jack, I wish I could make poems out of real objects. Thank you for allowing me this public intimacy. I'm intrigued by the you I've conjured here. You keep haunting these words. You famously wrote, words are what sticks to the real. We use them to push the real, to drag the real into the poem. What's the real in you? What exactly have I dragged, or translated, should I say, into the text? I've reached my destination, or so I think. For CD, poetry moves by indirection and thus changes the route and often the destination. Bye for now, fellow traveler. <coughs> Isometry. Gaze trade trained on gaze, positioned in front of groove between mirror panels. Split. Wobbling at the edges of both frames during tree pose, particularly. A translation is moving every point of a shape the same distance in the same direction. Not ambidextrous, I keep silent. I understand the dilemma of playing protagonist, prefer a supporting role, the only part of your body remaining undisciplined, detached. I am disobedient, writes my left hand. I'm going to read you a translation of a poem by a Uruguayan poet who was born in 1921 and died in 2010. And her name is Amanda Berenguer. Her work is rarely uh, translated into English, has been rarely translated into English, but a wonderful collection is about to come up with Ugly Duckling Press. And it has been co-edited by Kent Johnson and Kristen Dykstra. And it really is a marvelous achievement that this book with a select group of translators um, has been put together because she, I hope I can transmit this to you, she is an extraordinary poet, who was loosely associated with the neo-baroque movement. This poem is called Mobius Strip. I slowly sense a Mobius Strip feel that brief vertigo of homeliness or a shudder in its cage. I touch that bird on the outside and oyster on the inside, successive palpitating. I follow its unilateral, ambiguous leaf, hermaphrodite, exterior and interior at once. I press the noxious, vibrating sediment of pure truth as pseudopods reaching towards the dark. The sleepwalking ideas pacing about around at noon, the quiet cell, the room for rent in the patio of the loud citizen mouth. I brush against wilting flowers of vision recently pollinated, their shiny seal leaves on account of a black spring, the straight-haired bodies of scaly cornea fiber hanging on the smoky platforms or the docks where the porters spit dirt or in, their passenger, in the passenger lounges. Hence spring 
springs jammed in safes, memory, pens, unused sparklers, memories, parked express trains, empty, memories, I caress the memory, ready to jump, elastic, on instant photo on the parapet of a 30-story office building, a factory in Tokyo or Brasilia, toward the natural resting position. I probe, traverse, walk on the fence, the other face, the fabulous face, the double face, the same face, your anachronistic face, your face, social alchemy, scared, are you breathing, get it? I see you and they see us exceedingly, a face, countenance, facade, or quiet surface, do not forget, remember the front side presence, marching toward, in order to, because of, as per, without, over, behind this face of two interminable terms. Hurry, judge face, your verdict. Listen, face in the crowd. Listen, dog face, and yet another one. Long face, don't mix grease, oil, boiling water, vinegar face, funny face, the manifest. None other than the one with the gas mask, heads and tails embracing, producing golden eggs in the cellar of the Santa Maria crossing the Akron by a rifle submachine gun, reach the deep marrow of the exposed marrow, holy smokes, hideous mask. I slide, I enter, I dig this centripetal cave shelter, alluring carboniferous mine, 32,000 cubic meters of live rock to build the Simplon tunnel. Rife with poisonous diamonds, redeemable for life, for less than life, for the liveliest life, this corridor with no exit, looping corridor, ball of yarn around the coiled rope, winding staircase, ramp. Which of us finds the scheme's end? Vagabonds, wanderers, there, there in the hollow of your hand. You see there the three uncertain fates, miners, researchers, educating guinea pigs, electric filaments, bats of ultra short wave, for an experimental course taught by experts on corruptology. There at the end of the Annunciation Crypt, we ascend uterine, dove, shield, shell, clay, cupola, elevator up, wall, Le Corbusier, cement, sky, top floor, spherical steel tower, cantilever, construction of glass bricks, astronomical ceiling, open mouth, astrolog, equipped with limbs, calibrated to measure the angle subject to error of the eternity between us, between the observatory house, between you and I, lovers turned into the same body and soul velocity. We moonland on our own heart. We circled Mobius Earth. We marched over its gloved field at kilometers, light years from vertiginous bliss. It has no commas or punctuation, so ironically, it sounds a little choppy in the reading when it's supposed to be the opposite. What can we do? So I'm now going to read from this um, manuscript in progress. It's called Discontinuous Repetition, and it deals a lot with translation. And um, I'll read you a few poems from it, and then I'll read you some translations, self-translations from it. So this one's called Unlike Nostos, Algo is unspecified. Nunca sé por dónde comenzar, así que decido hacerlo al comer de una fresa. Incontable la cantidad de semillas. Can you say I'm of two minds? Yo diría que tengo ideas encontradas, lo cual abre dos posibilidades. Que se encuentren como amigas, cada una con su punto de vista, hace tanto que no se ven, o que estén a punto de agarrarse. Getting at each other's throats. Pensé que era un mexicanismo, pero no. You're getting territorial, lo cual a ti nunca te preocupa. What are you talking about? Si lo que dices o no es un regionalismo, te tienes sin cuidado, no te define. Since I'm just passing through, you mean. Pero te fuiste quedando. I went on saying, who's I anyway? ¿Quién habla? I. Interjección para expresar muchos y muy diversos movimientos del ánimo. Y más ordinariamente, aflicción o dolor. I. Pronounced I. Interjection used to express a multiple range of mood shifts and more commonly, affliction and pain. I never know where to begin, so I pick up the strawberry with its countless seeds. ¿Cómo dices tengo ideas encontradas? I am of two minds. 
como si en tu cerebro se alojaran dos mentes. Or your skull has Siamese twins. Lo cual te haría excepcional, but it's a set phrase, the language figurative or formulaic. It's reference, a common affliction, me hiciste pensar en referee. Who plays arbiter is up for grabs. Volvemos a los agarrones, don't get ahead of yourself. Volvemos a las cabezas. Ahead, not ahead. ¿Por qué no dices la verdad? Te pierdes en tus juegos de palabras. You interrupted me, up for grabs, to be for the taking. O sea, disponible, you misinterpret, to get your point across. I, pronunciado, I, primera persona singular en inglés. De ahí se desprende que algos, del griego, poco tiene que ver con algo, del latín. Prove that algo, an indeterminate something from the Latin, is unrelated to algos, meaning pain, from the Greek. The rest, there's no need to spell out. Remote disjunctions. I didn't mind ferns enough, I thought the last time I hiked up to look at point. They're so consuming. I'd be looking up to the tops of third generation redwoods or beyond towards Googleplex in Mountain View, which later Google confirmed was a continent off in the distance. And I'd be picturing those last days, pages and pens. Sorry to make you feel judged, I almost texted, stopped myself. Truth is, I judge, and if judges were capable of feeling sorry, they wouldn't. I welcome noise instead of trying to block it out with the folk music, musician song, Scottish, coming out of my laptop. If you don't remember a name, does it mean you don't care to remember? You've taken yourself to places whose specifics you've chosen to forget. You said you weren't there to keep track, but to experience. Which, when I'm feeling negative, I translate as ditching the thing as soon as you're done with it onto the heap of junk you're accumulating. Those who get the back end know what detailed tagging can lead to. A map so precise is the territory size. We're drifting apart again, spore-like. I'm done completing your sentences a version of the signs along the trail, anticipating the hikers' ups and downs. It begins with feeling, was the first. Spotted at the same time, I noticed a pet waste bag someone had left behind. Here, you leave your worries. Seen after I passed a guy whose grin was such, he did seem to have just dumped them. This one got me thinking about our tendency to ruin things. This is a beautiful moment. The last one wasn't part of the art. Please keep out of area under renovation. That resonated. La Sotis. It dawned on me just the other day at the launch of a former colleague's first book that if I ever was a funny poet, I no longer was one. I'd pick something amusing to read since the launch would be at a bar and people wouldn't want to sit still and listen to us drone on, but instead would be there to drink and celebrate their friend's accomplishment, no matter what they actually thought of his poems, which were good poems, don't get me wrong. Okay, they were somewhat insincere and a bit saccharine and nobody cared. That was beside the point. <laughs> During my reading, no one chuckled loud enough to let me know that they'd gotten the humor. Granted, it was subtle. My poem has to do with the kinds of people you encounter in hotels when, if you think about it, you're doing some of the most intimate things you could possibly do except die in the company of perfect strangers. Anyway, as I was up there reading, I couldn't see anyone because the mic was too big and right in my face. And when I read in settings such as these, all I can hear is the distortion of my voice, which then makes me jumble lines and mispronounce words I have no difficulty saying otherwise. Automobile, for example, which I can say easily, in Spanish. And from now on, will always be vehicle. <laughs> I was done and people applauded, sort of. When the next poet was up, the people around me were cheering and slapping their thighs, and then the next poet went up and cracked real witty jokes about Trump and Ted Cruz, while reading poems that were even wittier. People were in stitches. That's when I realized, perhaps I'm not funny anymore. But what the hell? Has that the marker of a work's ability to move its audience? I mean, what if Dickinson were up there reading, I'm nobody, who are you? Are you nobody too? And people broke out in laughter? Or it was Audelaire, for that matter, who had to pause up there while reading the pillars of nature's temple are alive and sometimes yield perplexing messages because of the audience hoots. Or better yet, imagine it was Catullus, 
explained to the crowd with, I hate and I love. Why do I do this, perhaps you ask? I do not know, but I feel it happening and I'm tortured. But wait, let's circle back to Baudelaire. What if he denounced people's hypocrisy at an open mic night? <laughs> and they laughed nervously, embarrassed, unless they didn't. And wouldn't that be odd? <laughs> There's a lot of waiting in the drama of experience. That's a line by Lynn Hedgeman. No single from the interface except for a frozen half-bitten food. Other than that, no logos. An hour is spent explaining to the group what I've forgotten to do with the mistranslation of a verb that means drifting but can imply deviance. The next hour goes by trying to remember, in the back of my mind, the name of the artist who makes paintings on inkjets. 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 Sorry. Why I think of him escapes me as my gaze circles the yoga bun of the tall woman in front of me. I didn't pay $20 to contemplate the back of the head. It's killing me. The pillars and plaster sinks with their tonsures floating amid electronic sound waves. At such volume, it could crumble. The virgin safe in a dimly lit niche as the tapping on my skull and the clamor of bones or killer bees assaults the repurposed church. This is what I saw, while in another recess I keep hearing Violeta Parra volver a los 17 and 17 year olds marching against the nonsense of arming school teachers. If I were an instrument, a bassoon. In the source language, we don't say spread the word, corre la voz is our idiom, easily mistaken for a voice that runs. I'm in the back, but I can see fingers gliding in sync with her vocalizations. How fitting her last name be Halo. Lucky for us here, time is measure and inexplicable substance. That's when I decide to stop fighting the city, use it in my favor, speak to strangers, demolish the work and the performance. Equivalencia, equivalence. Uno, one, a silence, un silencio clear, una llamarada, sip, sorbo, café, a coffee, before, antes de que se te bitter, supiera, amargo, a gap, un hoyo, in a hole, dentro de un agujero, two rows of caminos, to one path, para una trayectoria, and a pair of ojos cerrados, a snapping eyes, durmiendo la siesta. How many, cuantos espejos, mirrors, son dos, son dos, are two, night falls, and cae la tarde, and two lights, que aparecen dos luces, two lights appear. Two children, dos hijos, que ya going on three, ya son tres, on three. Three is peace and a pledge, tres es paz y garantía, an accomplice, complice, complice, an amigo, un enemigo. Three open book, three libros abiertos, three, tres, grano, grain, de sal, of salt. Four times, cuatro veces, I said, dije un hombre, en nada, and nothing. Cuatro, four is lo mismo, same, mismo, que tú, es de dos, es tres. We five times, if you ask me, si cinco veces te preguntas yourself, what am I, what am I, que hago aquí, I'm doing here, que me tus gama, burn your bed, let it burn, and split, dejar arder y ver. So the rest are just a couple of translations of this poem, and um, this one here is called A Beautiful Wall, and um, what I can say about it is it has no words with Latin roots, because I was told one time, a long time ago, by someone whose name I have forgotten happily, that if I wanted my translations to pass as being written in English originally, I should avoid Latin at all costs. <laughs> <laughs> so this, <laughs> sorry. So this poem is called A Beautiful Wall. A Beautiful Wall. A Beautiful Wall. Okay. <laughs> one, no then a flash. A sip of a hot drink made from roasted and ground seeds found bitter after swallowing. A bottomless pit. Two fold roads, one path, and shut eyes unawake. Two looking glasses are how many? With dust come lights. Two children, now three. Three is oak, is stillness, a chum, a foe. Three truths, three lies. Four times the speaker said nothing. Four and two are the same. Haven't asked five times why she stayed here. She set the bed on fire and left, letting it burn. This one is a translation through Japanese. Your turn. 
The quiet before an announcement. A mouthful of coffee. Then the acrimony, the acrimony in such bitter substitutions. At the path, there were two roads. I closed my eyes and speculated if they were mirrors. Not to say that I took this to be true on the basis of insufficient evidence, like in the tone. My reflection lacked such polish. One thing was clear, the three had two parents. Peace, security, sure, but also accomplices, enemies. Call them what you will, collaborators, cronies, reciprocal minions, nursing their resentment. A symbol, a distinctive designation, an epithet, even a record. When anything could be a name, two people might as well be four. What to do here? I'm no baker. I could make you a place in which to lie. Please, let me burn. Thank you. Creating without 
being responsible for creation, maybe. Um, but just the way I felt when I wrote Brother No One is how I feel now times whatever. You know, I thought it was bad then. So I just thought I'd share some of my anxieties with you. Um, and so the, the book is, a, there's a lot of surveillance, there's a lot of paranoia, uh, which if you remember, like, after 9-11, and so you know, there's a lot of poems set, like, they're, they're set in places like airports, uh, public places where a lot of private things occur. You know, we're, we're always uh, being watched in one way or another. Um, and so I'm just going to read some of these and then I'll read some uh, newer and no less beautiful. Asleep, the structure. Here, where to leap is considered tact itself, where shuffling lures none so much as what the television leaks, forced march, where over there is heard, and what I am is heard too, some other phrase ignored, where searches are performed on stomachs full of acid and protein, chicken, pork, and beef, the fish full of poison, the turkey out of season, where everyone's nose is against the window, where a woman is poised to pry us from the window, where the window doubles as a wall, no trick, where the trick is above, on the other side of the ceiling, wired through trusses and beams, old air and new air, the word sounds trapped there, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. Unmoving, we remain unmoved. Let's fake like we don't need motion and sit here stiller than static and less captivating, holding nothing, not even each other's body parts, forbid even the innards, everything but the heart, the stuff it squirts through us. In stages, creepingly at first, then in a rush, we hanker, not for what we did, used to do, but for what we could do, envision as we sit. In stages, slow, then not, we start to resist, bargain among for a shift, a twitch. Not even a hacking cough permitted, nothing like a sneeze. The contract, as long as there is one to enforce its edicts, we, unmoving, must remain fixed, clutter, freckle, shudder, burlap, feather, fog, lint, dirt, frook, twine, ash, dust, knot. Something dark indeed. We chose the title of Proust, which I'm sorry I need to say that because I took it from him, but it has nothing to do with Proust. <laughs> or the final, I guess, is highfalutin illusion. And that's what I was chewing. I'm not sure if the bone was showing. Possibility always has an end in it. The end can be smooth or not. The screen door cannot not think shut. If I ease it too, it don't shut. I cannot sleep when it rains or with three in the bed. No hot water, no flame for the stove. When it rains, a pond forms. Two steps down and I'm knee deep. Each of those rocks contains crystals. Crack one open and see for yourself. A little piece of light in that dark. Hit it harder, mister, if you want to see. I'm not watching from a distance. I'm right there in the middle of what I'm saying. What I'm saying has no bearing on what I'm reading. I'm eating what was a creature, and the bone, soft as styrofoam, is no match for these teeth. Braces gnaw at the insides of my cheeks. Mouth guard don't fit. The braces don't guard my mouth. They work on teeth. When kicked in the face, I like to be protected somewhat. The end is asphalt. One of the many advantages, <coughs> and it's, I was going to say one of the advantages, because I couldn't think of many, but I guess there are many, of having kids um, and teaching them things, is you get to read weird books, you know, say, like weird books find their way to your house, and you're forced to read them. And, <laughs> uh, and so this, and I just thought, like, it, it, to be honest, it can be mind-numbing, you know, at times. Um, but then sometimes a book is so kind of weird and disturbing and enters your consciousness and your dreams that you end up saying, I have to do something with this. So this, you know, this book of, and I had two kids, and this book 
class in a while. It's a book about sharks, which is also something I don't usually like to think about. Um, <laughs> loves the water. So this is called Teeth Deer, and it's just, just you know, making do with what life gives you. A shark's sharper teeth flee on contact, bream the darker side of the sea. Pisk swollen and merciless sea, it moves nowhere but up, piston, and down, its literal fragments strewn behind the assholes of whales. The whale shark, though huge, is harmless. Cookie cutters unplug the sides of submarines, live off the sides of whales. The whale shark lives near the sea's roof, bumps into ships, filters plankton, swallows plankton. The dwarf shark fits in a palm. Saw sharks dig up what they devour. A bonnet head digs and pins. Nothing can budge the swell shark wedged in a crack. The thresher's tail delivers a mean slap to stun. Step on the carpet shark if you want your foot stumped. Ditto with the angel shark. If you can walk on water, you have nothing to fear. Your needs will be met when you arrive. If you can walk on water, my offer to bathe your feet at the end of your journey, to kneel and bathe your feet, is empty. The fullness comes in the delivery. It's called CIA Sunrise. The object you see, of course, is not the object you think you're seeing. That object being a concoction of lubricant and hasty, a string of wire less barbed than deflated. Please excuse such a situation. The agency has expressed willingness to rectify the sun's orbit by any means necessary. The agency is serious about this, so please. When the sun writes itself, you won't notice much of a difference, really. And the cost won't cross your soap dish of a mind, that glycerin-encrusted vessel no self-respecting self would feed from. Arms and weather. The stars brought thunder lightning's scapegoat. The sky hides from the weather. Ditches spew, shingles flee roofs. The bashed-in fender weeps for its former self. Streams worm and swell, will shift overnight. Troops at the border finger the wet. Stars can beam, boat to continue their dying. They're sailing toward the earth, unwilling to bow alone, to let us borrow any more light. I'm gonna read a couple of migraine sonnets, which are uh, dedicated to the makers of raw packs which is, keeps me going in a lot of days. So I'm just gonna read a couple. The toilet is looking good today. <laughs> It'll receive nothing today. Swallowing carpet fuzz is no cure, nor is the one eight drill bit champ. How many times can an ankle sprain? You can't box with your thumbs up. Something is always hurting bad. It goes unseen for good. What doesn't kill you makes you sicker. Your own private disaster to mull. How many times can an ankle scream? He takes half and half with his brandy. Where's the liver anyway? Some third wheel and its spokes detour a common cause. Cockeye man and ether boy shake what needs to be spoken. Speak what needs to be broken. I moved back and moved back untoward nothing but down. I moved in and moved in. The space cleared then gone. Every item of note evicted. Every human ghost. The room shorn and wound down to bare and shuck. I, the drywall insulate. Ninety-seven percent of the population live within five miles of the coast. Was it there? I saw the sea like sea, its recycling bin sneezed up by every other swell. Ragweed reaches this far, the wind. My eyes so red, so red, they raw, close. I've been told pink tissue is stuck and clumps to the stubble beneath my nose. The wind leaves that part alone. 
I've been told everyone loves a beach scene, especially when the beach's name is not known. I keep that in mind, will not reveal, but might not be able to resist a hit or two. There is no boardwalk, no pier. My goddamn face is leaking. I do not belong here. Brother Nolan. I am under the shine today. Today, I'm under the shine. I cannot feel my ear today. Today, I can't feel my ear. The pills are lined up in front of me. In front of me are all my pills. There's no water here to take them with. There's no water here to drink. Someone on the other side is turning and shaking the knob. Someone on the other side is kicking and cracking the door. I am under the gun today. Today, I'm under the gun. I cannot feel my mouth today. Today, I can't feel my mouth. My brother is in the room with me. My brother's name is Noah. My brother is counting trains today. My brother is naming the trains. I have nowhere to go today. Today, I have nowhere to go. I will stay in and sleep today. Today, I will stay here and sleep. My brother is lying in front of me. In front of me lies my brother. I will climb into my body now. Now I will climb into my body. My brother will count me to sleep now. I will be counted into sleep. My brother will rock us to sleep now. He will rock our body to sleep. I am under the shine today. Today I am under the shine. My brother's name is no one today. My brother's name is no one. Okay, I'm going to switch a little bit to uh, poems I mostly wrote in New Hampshire. Um, so there's a lot of cold, snow. So it's called static and snow. Um, it's called Winter View. Sometimes I face the sky. Sometimes I face first in the snow. No horse to guide or pull me out of. No horse to ride. Dawn comes to he who's stuck in place. Dawn comes. I move when I think, and now I cannot move. My mind can grasp anything when I move. A map will be mine within moments. Any list or fact, any scrap. I could sing pie to 60 places. Here for months, here my mind has only snow. Fed nothing but snow. If I could move, I would, of course. I would move without stopping, and my mind would fill, and my mouth would sing what fills my mind, and any human face that crosses my face would be happy, knowing my mind was moving again, knowing I was I again. But I am not I again. I am less I than I ever was. And what if it's not I in the snow, if it's my son there, if I am not I but a human face crossing, watching his mind let go? If the snow were not snow, but a storm in his mind, a flame set loose by exposure. If he were sunk in his mind, and the storm of his mind, and not the snow. If everyone stepped back and watched him go. River Crossing. There, where stones populate the underneath, splay rain as it blends and stops being rain, raises the river, water into water, stone into soil, too slick to stand or walk, too wide to freeze or span, to cross you must swim, the current a visible instance of movement. You'd enter the water here, and if not pulled under, would emerge so far downstream, the crossing would require another journey entirely, on foot, over uncertain terrain, over what, through ownership, through deed, is called property, thus encroachment, thus trespass. The mind, though, can cross along with the eye where it can see. The body, my dear, counts for so little, nothing really, here. River border. On one side of the bridge, rapids. On the other side, water sinking still. You there in the middle, neither moving nor still. The river has no borders, it is the border. The bank has no hold on the water. The bank is dirt and rock 
and is worked by water. You can walk along the river, but not in it. The water will bear you with it, or send your feet's hold on the bottom. The river bears whatever's there. The river does not move, it goes. It goes nowhere, from nowhere to nowhere. I'm going to read some winter songs. Um, there's just like a bunch in the book. I'm just going to, they're all short, so I'm just going to skip through them. So, winter songs. The piss on the tree is no statement. The piss on the snow beneath leaves slobber the earth. I pull at my face, at the branch in my face, and serve a sodden song, swerve a ridden wrong. There are no eyes for this. There is so much more sky now, so much more gray in the sky now, more pain in the sky now. To shiver past your prime, an ice dappled joy. Forget what happened the winter before. Forget and forbear, the path runs right through you, the packed, immaculate path. Bent sky over a bent house, Erase what will not announce itself under the sun's clear eye. Drag it all down to melt. Piles and piles of melt. Hit the ground running. Hit the ground. Hit the face in front of you. Hit the tree and its window, too. A broken toy, no please or thank you. Welcome to this ditch with a view. Honk at the swarm at the feeder. Aim for the swarm. Don't ever say it's cold. Don't call this a problem. Let's cross the icy bridge arm and arm and arm. Snow is never silent. It pokes as it falls. This common house can feel every flake. Once the snow stops, it's silent. But then it's not snow. It's not snowing. As when the rain stops, it's not raining. The sun, etc. The fog, the clouds, the bliss, etc. What the roof holds is not weight, but the illusion of weight corralled and condensed. The gutters peak, the shingles speak, the shutters creak. I wait all day for something to break. The snow makes the same mistake twice, strikes the same place twice. You have it so wrong. We go into the ditch by choice. Our dream there is to ride. I'm just going to read two more. I'm going to read um, Elegy, Elegy, which is for Vic Chestnut, a singer-songwriter who I was friends with um, when I lived in Athens, Georgia, uh, who you know, had a lot of medical issues um, and died prematurely. Uh, and so the reason I mentioned that is because there's a line from one of his songs uh, in the poem. Um, so when I quote the you know, when you hear a quote from him, it's, it's uh, one of his songs. So it's called Elegy, Elegy. The dead keep coming back to us, whether we will their return or not. In our sleep, when we slip to resist, in books, and in song, when the voice shuffles forward to call, I'm still alive, I win the prize, I'm still alive, even though he's not, even though he knew that this song someday would prove false a sometime untrue statement that no one, not even the ghosts, can retract. Instead, those of us left are left to notice and miss and hurt. How thin is the human voice? It cannot keep even the dead distant on the other side of anything one would call anything. Okay, and I'm gonna finish with a poem from um, one of my, I guess, newer poems, aren't that many, um, which I actually wrote in the Emily Dickinson house. A friend of mine was visiting, and I mean, I've been there a bunch of times, so he was walking around, uh, and I was just sitting there, feeling that, you know, so I had to write something, I was just sitting there for an hour. So I wrote a poem. It's called Permanent State. I mean, I did look at stuff, there's still cool stuff, but there's only some examples of all those books, and uh, there's some great tarot cards there. But eventually, I have to do something else. So, permanent state. How did you get here? Why did you come? Is the leaf stripped oak strong enough for the journey you planned? 
And what about your coat? I see that it's thin. Worry that you might shiver yourself right off and no one would notice since you're already dead. Sad then, your loss when it occurred. Sadder now, the return. No ghost should have to suffer again. But we both know there is no place here for shoulds, only is's and ours and was's and were's. There is no place here for promises, for dreams, those made of nothing being nothing but words. Thank you. It's not about a rupture in the curtain that divides one language and one culture from another. It's about bridges between them, about commonalities and differences, about dispensing <coughs> and labels and categories. Sawako's books include The Ants, Mouth Eats Color, Sagawa, Chika Translations, Anti-Translations and Originals, and Costume. Uh, Sorry, long, long language. Um, maybe I don't know. Just fast, just fast. A translation of a handwritten notebook of Tatsumi Hijikata's dance notations. She's co editor with Lisa Samuels of the Trans Pacific Poetics, a gathering of poetry and poetics engaging Trans Pacific imaginary. Please welcome. It's always a relief when the thing you're about to read matches the thing that they talk it about sure in the introduction. <laughs> it doesn't happen to me often, I have to admit, it almost never happens. Um, thank you, Ed, and thank you to everyone who made this beautiful event possible, um, those whose labor may be visible and invisible also. It's such an honor to be here in such great company, and Thank you to Monica and Brian for their readings too. I'm happy to follow in good footsteps. Um, so, I am going to read some new work. It's brand new. Um, a work that is a group of works, a group of poems. Uh, the, the title is called, the book I'm working on is called Some Girls Walk into the country they are from. I came up with this title and I thought it was perfect and then later realized that title is kind of a perfect cross between 
a bad question and a bad joke. And uh, this book is populated with a lot of girls. I'll mention to you, I have kids also, and the children's literature does make its way into it, whether I, I didn't realize that until I um, heard Brian say it, and I thought, that's where I got the, <laughs> the, the nuts and, the plate of nuts and bolts was uh, an image from one of the books that I read with my child. So here we go. Girl Soup. I get tired of being the one to make all the decisions. So when they asked where I wanted to eat, I said that I didn't care, I'd eat anything at this point. Next thing I know, I am face to face with a bowl of girl soup, and I just can't bring myself to even dip my spoon in. Some of us at the table are in a hurry to eat the soup. They are specifically trying to eat the girls quickly because they seem to already know that if you wait too long, they turn into cyborgs or robots and those are a bit harder on the teeth. I can see that some of the girls are still alive and look like they wouldn't mind getting extracted from the soup, so I consider that option. But when I squint, I see that there are actually girls all over the floor with varying amounts of soup bits clinging to their clothes. You didn't think they were naked, did you? And so that does not seem like much of a solution either. Just at the moment, I think I am running out of options. Something comes over me, and I take a deep breath, and I do it. I jump right in there, that bowl of girl soup. No one is checking IDs or anything, and no one is questioning my gender or size or race or voter affiliation. And I quick round up all the girls in the bowl into a large huddle. We have now obliterated two major problems. Huddled together, we are too large to eat. And also, we've taken care of the problem of the eater. <laughs> heat event. All the girls had been instructed to bring their own heat. All the girls forgot to bring their own heat. Girl A makes a quick run to the corner store, as if they sell that kind of thing there. She returns with beef jerky. It is true that I can detect some modicum of temperature emanating from the faces of some of the other girls. It is just the tiniest amount, but I did feel a tiny bit of kinetic energy as the eyebrow of girl B raised itself subconsciously. Girl J didn't know she was supposed to bring it, but what if you just put your finger, nay, your whole hand, here, yes, here. And that is what girl H does. Soon, girl I does, too. Girl E buys a heater. The hot air blasting from girl E serves to further dry the dried up beef jerky belonging to girl A, while also causing serious damage to the moisture equilibrium of the skin of girl G. I haven't talked about girl C and girl D, nor girl F. Either they have no heat, or they have had no heat or they are not any heat any more longer than this. No, they don't have the means to hold it. Girls stealing the air out of my pulmones. Bald girls and old girls and non-bald girls and marathon and folded girls, all of them show me up on the upside of despair by arriving at my pulmonary entrance with their individual airbags shimmering in my quickening intake. Drop one by one into my basket of helpu. It's on the way, helpu is on the way, away, a cut, slap, dash, out of here. Instructions, gesture towards memory, all balled up and thing-like. Fall play to landing on thickets of hair, lush, lush, and quiet tumble, rush upward, a path opening elsewhere. A newer purchase on my little baggie of emergency air. Emergent tether of hair, skin, flesh, fleshiness of lung matter, thereby under the premise that it can be given back, theft only temporarily so, so so shit and piss cunt, all clarity fucking thickness. Take it, giving it back, I hold out, I open, I close, trying to trap a girl in the act, you make me feel like a natural error, force of artifice, admonished absorption. Now witness that. Hold, hold it, open again, opening again, opening new definitions of ownership, felt presence of taking it. Don't, don't you take it. 
Um, now I've got a series of translations I've been doing of some of these girl poems. And I'm going to read the translation first, and then I'll read the original. There are multiple girls and ways of appreciating Olivier Messiaen. Girl F's the getting, and tiredness is the reference, and the other is girled by their initials. There's the decisive finding, that is, the name outer, the girl eacher, the come what may, but there are also some extremely marching sheets, which makes girl J say very well why there was so much high name fuck of you at asking for, it is yours. It is girl F swallowing. There's no hardness, no embarrassment, no whiling, just this listening. So intentions were a little girl J by whose whispers, because amid all this bare audibility, justly a case would want you. Here's the original. Girl names. Girl F gets tired of referring to the other girls by their initials and decides to find out the name of each girl, come what may. She marches up to girl J and says, hi, my name is Fuck You For Asking, what is yours? <laughs> girl F swallows hard on her embarrassment while she listens intently to girl J who whispers barely audibly, I'm just in case you wanted to hear more about my vagina than you ever imagined possible. Girl F blinks twice towards the sweet, innocent eyes of girl J for a moment, then looks over at girl H, who shakes her head. So here's another um, pairing, and this one I will alternate. They're in paragraphs, and I'll do the translation and then the original paragraph give that a whirl. All the girls and their audience member wake her. Girl F has the high sun, but cold you when did girl A. Don't let the canvas clap you. If you kick the faintest leg of kid lurking with dormia wheels on her body, it's just your swollen water. She has had none at all for at least three surfaces and we've given her a good containment. Have a raft. Don't take the violet tongue. Welcome. Girl F has the decent handshake, but sorry you got girl A. Don't let the limpness fool you. If you smell the faintest whiff of lurking door now on her hand, it's just your imagination. She has had none at all for at least three days, and we've given her a good scrubbing. Have a seat here. Don't take anything out. Here hangs girl J, but fortunately she has mouthed that she rolled up too soon. There she reveals. You can shoot your deli fangin job towards her fury if you must, in spite of your kid's awareness of the faces. Here comes girl J, but fortunately she has realized that she's come too soon. There she goes. You can shoot your deli fracking bunch towards her back if you must, in spite of your awareness of the consequences. Do you see the move in this crawl? Put your drag into her mouth self, hold over something, and untie the knot slowly. This is your secret imprisonment work. Finally, your hand will burn, panicked, flipped, drowned, soaked, and unable to speak is girl D's able snack in stop pause, lift her hand. Do you see the hole in this box? Put your hand into its mouth, grab hold of something, and pull it out slowly. This is your secret yo woman's work. Finally, your hand will shine. Muted, tenacious, orphic, slowly. And inside that box is Girl D's egg crack in shallow freeze. Hold on. Do not clench up when the pants of Girl B, Girl E, and Girl G pull up calmly all around you. You may observe their down cockle knife. 
Should circumstances hook through, it is your obligation and belt to cut your strength immediately. You have not been drowned with tied-up neck glasses. Do not worry when representatives of Girl B, Girl E, and Girl G pull up their chairs around you. You may observe their bamboo tights. Should circumstances change, though, it is, not, it is your obligation and duty to avert your eyes immediately. You have not been provided with protective glasses. And definitely do not turn baby about what girl C is closing. Her shut is field, it is not a push. Thus, you should also claim that her deep longer punt is no effort either. If it should so happen that you exhaust her, even by raft pitch, by all means, drown not, touch fall, anywhere she is open, seen, or crated. And definitely do not worry about what girl C is wearing. Her uniform is real, it is not a costume. Thus, you should also note that her deaf willow punch is no joke either. If it should so happen that you touch her, even by accident, by all means, do not touch her anywhere she is navy, black, or silver. <coughs> girl F, girl H, and girl I are here to float and tongue. Whatever you do, do not close your pitches with some open gathering of pan flammatories and say to girl H that she looks feverish from some emergency. She doesn't, let's just take that back right now. Girl F, girl H, and girl I are here to protect and perform. Whatever you do, do not squint your eyes with some flickering recollection of pantomime <coughs> and say to girl H that she looks familiar from somewhere. She doesn't, let's just get that straight right now. <laughs> Last one from the series is a, a little seasonal poem. It's called Deflated Rubber Turkey. There is one atop each of the girls' heads. <coughs> Clearly, they've been playing this game for a while. There is only one girl whose turkey is still full of air, and that girl is Girl D. The game is called Duck, Duck, Turkey. <laughs> they go through the motions of having an it, and having that it walk around the outside of a circle of sitting girls, tapping them on their turkey heads while saying, duck, 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 until they say turkey, while hitting the turkey on the head of a girl and then running around the circle trying to sit down in the open spot in the circle before getting tagged. The general stance over here is based on the unshakable belief that playing this game is going to lead to a better, more just society for all once everybody's turkey is equally deflated. And although most of the turkeys are indeed mostly deflated, none of the girls can keep themselves from glancing furtively at the head of girl D, her hair positively radiant in the light bouncing off of the almost fully inflated rubber turkey on her head. How can this be? What is wrong with everyone else's turkey? Did girl D get a refill or more air than others to begin with? Is that really a turkey? Maybe girl D's turkey is not made out of rubber like the rest. What if the rubber turkey of girl D was filled with turkey? <laughs> okay, so um, I am going to read from Mouthy's Color, which is, uh, I get this nostalgic feeling whenever I read from it and think about it because it was such a feeling of great liberation that I had when I made this book. I was just trying to do everything wrong as much as possible. So I wanted to break whatever rules there were in conventions of poetry publishing, which meant that I was going to have to publish it myself because I couldn't imagine. I just couldn't imagine <laughs> anybody who would publish it. But you get to do a lot of fun things, like here's a picture of me kissing a lizard, um, which also happened in that month that I was making the book. So I, I lie a lot in this book. It's, I call it Sagatika Translations, Anti-Translations, and Originals, but there's actually a, other things going on, which Chris mentioned. And I'm going to um, read some of the other components of this book. Part of it is that I saw it in 
in the sense of a, like a curated gallery and there were going to be this and this and this in conversation with each other just by sharing the space. So some of these, some of these contents are just poems and one of them is called We the Heathens and I actually think that was my Bush era poem, <laughs> speaking of when we write what we write. We the heathens. Last night we go to have Chinese for dinner and my friend who is visiting from another planet is horrified and perhaps a little excited also until I explain to her that we are having Chinese food, not Chinese people. We go to a place that serves not dumpling soup, which I love, but soup dumpling, with which I am unfamiliar. The soup is actually inside of each dumpling and everyone develops their own system of eating. As we poke our chopsticks voraciously into the folds of the crispy fried whole exploded fish, which is delicious, it becomes clear to me that we would have no right to be shocked or mortified or outraged or even surprised or upset should some creature from another planet descend upon the earth, pluck our people off the ground and fry us up, tearing away at our flesh with relish. My friend Morton, a sweet and gentle man, is sitting quietly beside me with his uneaten hamburger. I don't know how he managed to get himself a hamburger in a Chinese restaurant, but there he sits, and there sits his hamburger with the top bun off. Morton says he wants live ants on his burger, but does not want to go hunting for ants himself, so he's waiting for the ants to come to the burger, at which point he will put the top bun back on and eat. I tell him that he will probably have better luck with that outside, and he says, that's a good idea, thanks, and then goes outside with his hamburger, and that's the last I ever see him. <laughs> so, a long time after I had written that poem, I came across this poem by Francis Chung, which is called, and so that, that We the Heathens poem was written in, like, really the day after I had eaten soup dumplings in Chinatown in New York. And then I discovered this poet, Frances Chung, who was a Chinese-American New York school poet, and she, she writes from her uh, life in the Lower East Side in Chinatown. And here's her poem, untitled poem. My Italian girlfriends dressed up on Sundays in dresses and heels. They told me they were going to eat chinks after confession. I thought that this was either someone's house or the name of a restaurant. Little did I know they were headed for Chinatown. Not having any spending money and never going to church, I never joined them. We went our separate ways on Sundays. So I grew curious about Frances Chung, and I got her book, which is called Crazy Melon and Chinese Apple. Um, it was published posthumously, and this book is it's published from Wesleyan and was edited by Walter Liu. And in it, she, he talks about the sort of bold things that she did, one of which is that she dedicates the book to, on the very front, says, for the Chinatown people. And then Walter says, she dedicated this book to a community of people who can't read it. And not only that, but then the very first poem begins, Yo vivo en el radio chino de Nuevo York. And so she starts her poem, so she starts her book in Spanish and goes on. And, um, and Walter talks a little bit more about, about what she is doing. And here's, this is a quote from Juliana Chang on her essay, Reading Asian American Poetry. Quote, an interlingual poetics would change the shapes and sounds of dominant languages like English by pushing the language to its limit and breaking it open or apart. The interpenetration of languages allows us to reimagine these languages and cultures not as discrete entities, but as radically relational. In light of Chung's deft zigzag, this is back to Walter Lee, in light of Chung's deft zigzag through linguistic zone, she should be seen as an early master of interlingual Asian American poetics, a distinction that has been largely accorded to Teresa Hoffman Cha, whose time in New York temporarily coincided with hers. As Chung herself stated, in my poetry, I play with images from the Chinese and Spanish languages. 
and one of the workshops she taught was on trilingual poetry. Her writing juxtaposes the language of the Lower East Side, perhaps for future readers like the many bilingual students she taught yet another language to, mathematics, in JHS 22 on Columbia Street, Murray Bergtraum High School on Pearl, and Dr. Sun Yat Sen Intermediate on Hester Street from 1973 onward. So I knew that Frances Chung had to be part of my book too, and I invited her in and um, included her in the pages. One of the poems that uh, was inspiring to me is called Scenes Gathered from a Chinese English Dictionary. And without knowing how she wrote it, I imagine that these are literally scenes or characters or elements that come out of individual words in Chinese. So I'll read you a little excerpt of that. Clouds clearing away, simple clothing, rose flower cake, coral chopsticks, night shining pearl, to gaze at the ocean and sigh, third day after a child's birth, moon clouded over, to give rice to the poor, husband of a wife's younger sister, to lie down undressed and sigh constantly. I love the thought of that. I imagine that there's a word in Chinese that means to lie down undressed and sigh constantly. <laughs> so um, one of the things I did in this book was there's a poem called Waves or Nami in um, in Sagawashika's original Japanese. And I lifted the Chinese characters from this poem, and I translated the components of the Chinese characters and turned them into characters in the new poem called Waves, a list of characters, and Backside, which is another poem. So uh, I'm going to read part of this poem. Husband of water. I should explain. So, so something like that, husband of water, is a word that means sailor. And when I felt curious about why there was a sailor in a Sagawashika poem, someone who wrote modernist poetry in Japan in the 1920s, is because she's translating Harry Crosby. So his sailors became her sailors. And now it's my husband of water. Husband of water, and then the people. Fresh looking bamboo that lives fast and dies young, moves forward. That which halts rice from growing in the mouth. That's the, I just have to tell you, that's the character for teeth. That which, that which halts rice from growing in the mouth. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to share some, well anyway, so that's how that comes. Um, I just want to, let's see, now, now I'll read a couple of uh, poems from Texture Notes, which was my study of texture. I wrote these poems shortly after I moved to Japan, and everything just came up texture during that time. So here's one. Whenever I meet new people, I want to touch them first and find out their texture. I also do this in stores when I am shopping, so shopkeepers hate me. I turn to the person on my left and ask very gently if I can lick his or her eyeball. The food arrives and I place a slice of raw cow tongue in my mouth because someone once told me that this is absolutely the sexiest food item in the world. Do you like kissing cows? I get up to go to the restroom, but the person on my right, instead of moving out of the way, offers to me his or her arm with a large gash from last week's motorcycle accident. There is an awkward moment and then I sit back down so that I am more stable. I clean off my right hand before I touch, ease my finger inside, and then further, 
some asshole at the other end of the table is making stupid sound effects. But in any case, I am soon unaware of everything, oh no, everything at all. And if I were not myself at this moment, I would probably have to avert my eyes, unable to watch as a certain virginity is lost and then lost. Making it tangible. All of the things still up in the air. Employment, housing, children, future, dinner tonight, who won the publisher's clearinghouse sweepstakes, the World Series, impending heartache, subletting the apartment, the next few years, which movie will get seen when, this week, and with whom, all show up for a moment in tangible physical form, an airborne flash flood, before gravity takes over and they all crash down as I try to disappear quickly, hide under a rock, a spoon, a song, keeping it real. Texture of a free, autonomous, independently, and non-battery operated, small, traditional, and smoothly surfaced rock. Its very smoothness a testament to the non-battery operated yet eventlessly eventful life it has heretofore sustained. People, pilgrims, innocent bystanders, drivers by, tourists, and locals alike come and gather independently and in their own time, in their very own time, to admire it and enjoy it, to provide a physical, chemical, psychoanalytical, or textural analysis of it, to assign it values of beauty. A standard commercial airplane flying a standard transatlantic or Pacific route with a standard set of economy, business, and first class passengers and correspondingly standard crew of pilots, flight attendants, and in-flight meteorologists. This very aircraft, also filled to the brim and every cranny with diamonds, and the flight attendant who wades her way slowly, patiently through the stones and down the narrow aisle, pushing the usual cart of drinks peanuts, Salisbury steak, and long ago fried potatoes, and what her face looks like at the end of it, and just then the diamond that drops out from under the neath of her skirt. Nightmare about hamburgers having fallen into one, or rather being swallowed by an avalanche of undercooked hamburger meat. I am in the pinkest part of it and try the spitting method to find out which way is up. I decide, however, that any direction is good enough so long as it is fast, as my assumption is that no hamburger can possibly go on forever. I worm my clothes off so that I can move easier, and I'm reminded of Carolee Schneeman's meat joy from the 60s, though I'm finding no joy in this. I struggle to get my clothes back on as I realize that the friction from the clothes is necessary to overcome the grease so that I can get out of this place. I think I see a light in the distance, though it might very easily be a lump of fat. But worse yet, clearer yet, I begin to smell smoke, a gas-fired barbecue. I call out, distressed and damseled to the hilt, hamburger, 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 for lack of a better way to describe the situation. And I'm quoting some long lost love poem, and so I am. You know, just when I started reading this poem, I realized I had this flashback that I think I read this poem out loud for the first time in my life in Amherst many, many years ago. And here we are again. <laughs> so, one last one for the road Oysters. It must be an ability to embody wetness better than other items of food and beverage. Raw oysters, even more wet than water, I would wipe my eyes with one in a desperate moment. Or rather, desperate for something that could act as a tonic, I would feed it to the next person who was in danger of drying out. Yes, you. Thank you.
Gucci and Luca is up next. Uh, are we taking a break? Um, we'll take a break. Yeah, let's take a break. Let's take a break. <laughs> He lived in Germany and Holland for a decade before immigrating to the U.S. in 2007. His numerous collections of poetry and prose include Nine East, Njele, Iwan Reef, Gado Scudo, uh, which won the Association of Nigerian Authors of Poetry Prize. And he lives in Berkeley. I didn't know anything about Uche until about 10 years ago, when my wife, Patricia Pruitt, picked up Eel on the Reef at a bookshop a few blocks away from here. She read it that afternoon, cover to cover. You'll like this, she said. This poet mixes it up pretty beautifully. It's as if Neruda and Césaire are having a conversation with Breton's Amur Fu, thrown in for good measure. I had no idea what to make of that, so, of course, I had to read the book. But he was right. It was an exceptional blend of surrealist imagery with politics and sex. Well, maybe not sex. More the surreal notion of sensuality, blood, body, tongue, sex organs, used both literally and metaphorically. Heady stuff, tough, bold, also exceedingly well executed. Not so many poets writing in English can pull off surrealism. Uche can. Not so many poets writing in English can pull off having political statements remain enveloped within a lyric, but Uche can. Not many poets writing in English can write so convincingly about the body. Uche can. He's an original. He's got forebears, of course, but he makes it new always. I'll let Uche introduce himself through his own words. And a voice to burn with arrives in triple frenzy, in cyclic precision. Thank you so much, Chris, for that receptive, warm introduction. And uh, thank my little daughter, I suppose, also. She's dead. It's been a for her to a long night. So I'd like to thank the organizers of this um, Pioneer Valley Poetry Productions for making it possible for, for me to meet some poets I've just read as well. Words seeing them face to face, hoping to be able to have a drink, share some words, eat some food with them, some noise. That doesn't happen often. Because the thing with writing poetry, as lots of us know, is that. I'm sorry, I'm gonna lift the mic up for you. Is that okay? Is that better? Hello? Better. Okay. Yeah. Can hear my voice now. It's pretty scary. It's all right. Thank you. 
So that's some of people write poetry, you know, at times it's a lonely business. You just start out there yourself, you know, wrestling with words, sometimes successfully, sometimes not. So I think there should be opportunities for poets to come together, to look at themselves. You know, um, she even share silences, but do it at close proximity. So for the evening, I would like to read from my latest book called Living in Public, which appeared about three, four months ago. Um, each of my books, say for the past 10 years at least, has been able to explore the three continents I've lived in since I left Nigeria in 1994. So each book I know this, it's not just, uh, sometimes not very intentionally, but there has been a mapping of the routes I've gone through, you know, places, people I've met, um, experiences I've had, and that I think is something that's very, very enriching in lots of ways, particularly for me as a person who produces those words. But more or less, I also feel very moved when I see how these words have touched other people. Because there's nothing like sending something out there and getting a response. Because sometimes you just write and send it out and wonder what the hell is going on. You know? <laughs> Even if there are reviews, I still want to know that ordinary human beings somewhere are reading those words. I'm not just academics, reviewers, people, poets themselves. I just want anybody who is able to read to be able to share those things, those words that bring it into the world. That's why I say it. And whether people call it experimental or not, it's not really my business. So I'd like to read, start reading from um, Living in Public. It's a, poem, it's, a, it's a book of a sequence of poems, practically. I'll call it a sequence. It's a sequence of 168 poems. And they're all numbered. So I just read from back towards the front. And because it's a sequence, you can't just, I can't really uh, talk about each poem I read. I might just say the number I'm reading. Because basically the poetry, like I said, is just what? An exploration of my bicultural self, and my bilingual self, and my multicultural self. Everything that I've experienced, eating, drank, seeing, all of them are what? Fit the work. So I'd like to read from poem 166, and then go down. The apocalypse got fat, got tame, got fat, got tame. And Jimmy said, let him freak fly, fly. Late afternoon love, coming back home to your nakedness. Sex is a shopper. As for dreamboats, let them be dreamy forever. Flowers and trinkets, rainy but vision is never far off. We shall keep on winning the universe and starve to save. We've passed the eve for compromises, this hunger and shadow. To read you was to be curious about the life you lived. The land of your desire could not be reached by following a map. You love maverick women. Go in, these poems have dark have windows. <laughs> I think I have a, a fellow reader right up here. <laughs> Your legs shadow my legs. I suppose the reason I'm drawn to you is that I love falling apart for a fresh start in domestic folly, the form of domestic folly, opulence of melting mariachi. Begins, the, the evening started with some essences of Mexico, and that seems to be a reference <laughs> to Mexico, you know, planning there. 
one for one nest. Blow up the ramparts. Star lost is still bound. To speak instantly of the instant. They live out each word and write. We need more whiskey. We need more than whiskey and hip up to rout this dispossession. A button marches, summer multiplies, rushes, sport vibes, creamy life. The last thing I expected was to see the bookstores of New York City disappear. I'm still pissed. Moonlight and they parry on a houseboat on the canal with Ellie. Between bike rides and taking over our clubs. If this is the totality of it, if this is the totality of it, walking a double shift, tossing cars, crotch, air, wet, funkadelically of beat. 111. In places I'm getting inked. Can you pass the manpower test? This car is a unit in the summer of rot. And we live well without revenge. A light in the savings of language. The hunter in a river birch. Simply, sincerely, sublime. Those mutating arabesques, aware of pulling away the days. Don't just sort out the prey. Flee the norm. Make the hour glow. For 97. Writing on a blackboard, there is a book bag I've got to retrieve. If you sucker yourself into becoming a nostalgia act, if you sucker yourself into becoming a novelty act, don't blame me. Damn the middle class mentality. My guilt is the penalty for not being mediocre. Where to begin is with the league of one. So effing sorry for blustery fuckery. Well, so much not understanding this. <coughs> so much the better because Hemingway and Stevens traded blows. Lobster, rage, rivalry, tilting in, jolt of asterisks, while a notepad followed your sideline, retraced your steps. A part of me exploded. Much of the rest any less so. What you rumble through these pages to find, you flame brightly at the other end of a conversation. They hemmed in the spirit long before they started firing at the flesh. I don't care about the next apostrophe. In due time, Bedlam will call on you. Each world knows a war. Each world is full of forbidden stories. Can you shrug up agitation? Can you shrug up imagination? A tongue menaced. A tongue rubbished. Now would you burn down the symphony, or would you rather trace the executioner? In spite of the presence of the unsaid, something has ripped up a picnic blanket. Astonished grace, vermilion wetness of milk in heel. Bring back the yolk, stand by the ledge if you want to burn out. I should not be waiting for a diluted dive. I wish to reach you beyond this pillow talk. Fate is blue and cools only for you. All those
those stratagems you use to opt out of life, thinking I won't come to the table with the issue of death. Blinded by purple, innocence spreads throughout the room. A place to learn what possession is. Your eyes are wide open. Your legs are wide open at five o'clock in the morning. Your heat, your voice, your kids, a matter moment. Shadow make promises in this poem. The people in this poem talk all the time. Its windows and doors croon. Despair has not provided functions here. Every color in this poem you can touch. There are moments of pleasure here. This poem wants to become a wolf. It laughs at timelessness. A breakfast table grows loquacious, tries his hand at calligraphy. Your spreadsheet proves that the project is viable. You weren't interested in self service that very moment. So you asked me to unhook your bra. I'm 49. The furnace is drunk. The soapbox is vile within the psychic barrier. This chemish with anagrams. The reclining jockey, the menaced music. Very much wanting her back, though it was no longer possible to pretend that the chaos and fear were not political. Imagine being slammed into spasms. You are female. You shake things up. Invincibility as ever. I cannot clutch. Summer. I make a beeline for the river. Find a protruding rock. Sit on it. Paint for hours. Bent. Eclipse asks. Where in the world is the world? Inventory of things that enter the dummies, walks and days and pages from a notebook. From 19. Come closer. What shattered wasn't poetry, except to say, Decibel, the terrors of precision. Up the stairs, the open air of broken ground. No trace of lace, senses of trellis. She is here to read what is clenched. We have come this far across the floor. Leisure knows the exact price of fancy. Meltdown after meltdown until a triumph rises to meet you. What we desire, what we desire beyond the print of bells, we were designed for brass buttons. Poetry without talking is a waste of fucking. I won't approach this heartbreak with a poem. You want to talk art. You want to get spanned. Bumpers and the uses of a kiss. Back to the text and desire. Dressing and undressing in mesmeric nearness. I won't approach you without these porcelain doll heads. A brass solace of a salt. Fingerless gloves. Teapot, sneakers. 
Deep nose need not repeat the same style. Getting high, going insane, crosswalk in multiple shadows, blow touch in the clutter. And the last poem. I read from another book called If Only the Night, published some years ago. And the title is Excess Baggage. In our lives, we all have some excess baggage. So it's left to us to shake them out and know when we have to drop them. Excess baggage. That might catch her fancy. All the keystones and phobia. All the men maps. All the calling shopping. All the queen's men. All the makeups, the close-ups, the pest-ups, the junk -ups. All the habingers of happy smugs. All the upbeat ultra men washing the gradual drying up of the deal. All the put ons, the carrying ons, the going ons. Nothing like them. Lightly neglected. The cut ups, the cut ups, the screw ups. All the dowagers, all the pillagers, all the ultra hyped, the comatose. The overdosed, all the hotline recalls of the near sweeper, the near cleanup of mayonnaise from kiosks, all the accessories of the neocolonial transactions, all the issues in the pantone of issues, all the outings of the shrewd red heels, all the hand woven tweeds, all the hand painted sweatshirts, all the well wrought mannequins. All the uptown screen tests, all the old drones and old drains of Europe, the old drawers of the old world, all the colonial makeovers, cutovers, hangovers, nest of frugers, nest to boppers, nest to raggers, all the rhinestones, all the elephants, all the bell ups. The way out, the sellouts, mostly confronted. The put downs, the let downs, the showdowns. All the super doers, the party founders, the overexposed boers. All the be offs, all the sash offs, all the tell offs, contrived. All the run downs, the pull downs, all the cramping. The slummings that were still lives over the long haul. Thank you. Lisa Barbal, um, and she too 
gave a good deal of time, a good deal of her life, actually, to making this evening and tomorrow evening possible. Um, for various reasons, she was not able to be here this weekend. Um, and I regret very much that, because she is, as those of you who know her, she's a wonderful poet and a wonderful person. And, um, and she is deeply, deeply missed. Okay, so it is uh, my uh, uh, assignment now to introduce a lady, Sikelianus. And uh, as I explained to her and apologized, I left the introduction at home. Therefore, I have to wing it. Uh, and I do what I can. Therefore, let me just sit, well, sit the, uh, first what I'll do is I'll just read you um, some of her many accomplishments. She has received numerous honors and awards for her poetry, nonfiction, and translations, including a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship, a Fulbright Fellowship, residencies at Princeton University as a Seeger Fellow, and in France at Brittany, in fact, and at Gatto, the New York Foundation of the Arts Award in Nonfiction Literature, James D. Phelan Award, two Gertrude Stein Awards for Innovative American Writing, and the New York Council for the Arts Translation Award. So that gives you some idea of who we are about to hear. Now, let me just uh, reflect a minute. Um, I first met Elaine many years ago, uh, one summer, when I was teaching at Naropa. And I was teaching there because of Eleni's aunt, who was Ann Walden. And uh, it was, for me personally, fairly scary experience. Because <laughs> um, all of a sudden, I was surrounded with amazing people. Um, like, for example, um, my next door neighbor was Allen Ginsberg. Um, and when I arrived, uh, what he said is, we've got to go shopping. Yes, we have to go shopping. So we went to the grocery store, and then he filled my cart with organic food. I mean, I, it, was, it was just sort of like an amazing experience and awareness of a whole world that somebody from New England, called New England, is not accustomed to. <laughs> so anyway, um, so, that, so that followed. And, and I had been told about you know, various students, and one was a lady. And, and, and of course, you know, she comes from an amazing family. Um, it's not just Anne. I mean, she is, uh, I mean, actually in a, in a frightening position. Uh, that is to say, she has so many relatives who are known that uh, to, to start your life as a poet with that, oh my God. <laughs> but the thing is, that she has shown that she is fantastic. Um, I, I, I don't know how else to explain it. I mean, it's just like every new book from a lady, like, oh, wow. And then I think, yeah, maybe it is a good thing to come from a fabulous family. <laughs> to everyone who made this possible. Um, I want to dedicate, or just honor, um, somebody from who taught nearby, um, who, whose work has been really important to me. She taught at um, UMass, and her name is Lynn Margulis. I don't know if you all know her work. Maybe if you live here, you do. A lot of people in the poetry world don't know her work. Um, she was a biologist. She died a couple of years ago, but one of the astounding and important things about her work, she didn't invent the notion of symbiogenesis. 
which is the notion that evolution was actually powered very much by organisms working together rather than competing. But she's the person who really developed it and made it public and fought like hell for it when she was ridiculed by many of the male scientists, including Richard Dawkins, pretty br brutally, who called her Attila the Hen. Um, and so it's really a feminist version of how evolution happens, because um, organisms can actually collaborate rather than compete to make changes. And um, her work was proved correct once we got gene sequencing and, and um, more um, accurate ways of looking at genetic material. And in the mitochondria, we see the rest who so were all walking around as with all kinds of remnants of species in our bodies and um, also being able to do things thanks to other species, like move our shoulders around. Thank you, salamanders. Getting my water. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to start with um, new poems from a project called Your Kingdom. And actually, when I read from this recently, Auntie Anne said, whose kingdom? What do you mean, your kingdom? And so what I mean is animal kingdom, your kingdom. <laughs> Got to keep it straight with Anne. Um, Lynn Margulis has um, influence might not be felt in these particular poems, but the, the project includes a long poem where I meditate on all those um, genetic adaptations, or all those adaptations that other animals did that we benefit from. Um, but I'm going to read some of the single poems from this project. So I'll read from those, and then I'll read from my uh, most recent book about 50-50. It's 9.18. You guys are very patient listeners. Paper film. Protect the real. We're making a movie of reality to protect the real. Big plastic screens held up for backdrop. We're protecting the water this way. The deep pools and springs beneath earth. The famous actress with short hair and shrewd eyes is in on it. Her falcon, sparrow eyes acting out reality in snatches and flashes. She is hunter, then hunted, hunter, then hunted, acting the real. The elephants holding up screens painted with mountains, grasses, woodlands, and swooping circles around the scene like a circus tent to hold reality in or imminent. The producers, the director, seem to think this reality is real. Just as the dreamer needed no help or vehicle to get to Denver, reality plays where it will. I should actually tell you, I just recently moved and so not settled that I realized that all the new versions of these poems are on a hard drive somewhere that I haven't unpacked. So these are earlier versions. If I seem confused, I am. Sparta through a hole in the past. Um, and I, I loved how much Sawaka told us about each poem. So maybe I'll tell you one thing. I was driving in a rental car through Sparta in Greece. Um, and. You could, s the rental car was about $15 a day, and you could actually see the ground through a hole in the floor of the car. Sparta through a hole in the past. I hoop like an owl on the roof. I am an ordinary girl. Even your iPhone can't capture it, because I'm from Sparta, where leaves late night look cut from bald trees. Circling the dusty internet cafe off the main drag in a white rental car with holes in the floor, I can see the asphalt blurring through all the way back to Sparta. I've invested, I've invented a harvest of words, bright Bitcoin. You can see straight through the years, shot through with air, back to me. Correspondences, 
harvest, you, bright, I, late, I, leaf, you, bitcoin, they, night, us, owl, it, asphalt, it, floors, we, see, you, air, us, years, I, I, rip the body, stitch it back, rip the body, take out the years, dirt, Pigskin, Pokemon, sub, sub. If you doesn't have a capital, neither does it. Rip the apple out of the body branch. Strip it, strip it. Ringed body working the dirt. Rip the iPod off. Stitch it back up. Rip Bitcoin out of the body sack. Stitch it back up. Slackening. Rip the stitch it. Starbuck pigskin. Stitch it. Mute body. Rip Sparta off your face. Strip your history dress in a space between the dash and the word, the most volcanically active word in our solar system is, it's so easy to say, you. Um, this poem might have a title in a newer version, but it doesn't in this version. You do an etymology of you, your thing. You do you, if you check it out, check it out. Is you related to yes? Or is that little tail a thorn? Stabbing into the world, tangling in orchid roots. You as in thou, not as in thing. One people, they, them, ahem. Yow, o, e, old English, use, proto, indo, these hummingbird little words with so much heft weigh nothing, holding nearly no history at all. Amen, Obi-Wan Kenobi, snow globe on the earlobe, poetaster to the master. I'm waiting for trains with children and friends. The eye is the binding in this poem, but you is the glue. Um, So the title of this poem is no longer exactly true. Last night I wore a bronze broadwing hawk foot around my neck and a peacock feather in my ear. But I actually do have this broadwing hawk foot around my neck tonight. I am addicted to birds. Some birds are addicted to beads. Satin bower birds have a surprise blue bead eye with which they seek bright items, and Gila monsters, which are beaded, are addicted to dreams of venomous, lizardy things, never dreaming of themselves as beaded purses, seamless, dreamed purses purge themselves to become beaded lizards again, and my dreams are about birds, but when birds dream of me, we cross mid-sky like two fist wing-sized black holes in flight colliding. It's not like self-corroding, then passing each other by, eye by eye. My dream says hi, birds says goodbye. Then I dreamed of a dazzling, trash-eating bird who herds jewel-colored blazing and hover. Oh, sorry, I messed that up. Then I dreamed of dazzling, trash-eating birds who heard jewel-colored blazing and hover over evolution, gate-crashing, what divide around human. We'll call this poem In Deep Grasses. In deep grasses, the lions would line the streets, lie down and feed themselves to dwellers, offering up lion heart. To eat the heart of a lying down lion, clean coeur de lion, clown lion lying human down. In a place where one grass blade makes the next grass blade shade, that grass blade made the next grass blade's root, that 
grass blades root, shaped it like a foot for the next grass blades blade that cut it to the quick, quick, quick of lion life flame. Astinomia nosicomio. Astinomia means police and nosicomio means hospital in Greek. I keep confusing words, calling policemen hospitals, mayors, town halls. I mistook Corinthian power plant for an ancient palace, deep harbor for dream. Then I remembered language is an approximation we keep hoping will draw <coughs> up exigence like water from a well, metal, dust toward magnetite. <coughs> the old woman told me a story as we walked by her village's deep harbor. In winter, the waves sometimes lap right up into the streets, and when she was a child, the child was taken that way while his sister played and the mother was out working the fields. When the mother came home, the daughter said, don't bother looking for Cosma. A wave took him. How astounding then the accuracy of language and wave. Sometimes it licks clean, licks the pot clean. And that actually, um, just to, since Ed mentioned my family, <laughs> That is a story that was just told to me this, I guess, yeah, last fall by a woman on my great-grandfather's home island, Lefkada. Um, and I was there because they just opened, uh, they opened, my great-grandfather was a poet and they just turned his childhood home into a museum and I was there for the opening and um, was walking in this beautiful little village with this woman and she told me the story about when she was little and a baby just being swept away. Um, it was an amazing visit because my great-grandparents were in part dedicated to reviving a lot of traditional um, knowledges and arts. And so all these older women started giving me things from their prika, their um, uh, dowries that had been, or like their grandmothers or great-grandmothers dowries that had been, like the women had grown the linen washed the linen, uh, carded the linen, woven, you know, did and made it into thread and woven these amazing dresses and then they hand embroidered them and nobody wears them or uses them anymore. So I came home with these amazing hand woven. I wish I were wearing one right now. <laughs> um, okay, let's see. Yeah, I'm gonna read you uh, one more from these newer poems and then I'll move to the book. And this poem, I guess a couple things went into this poem and one was, I don't know if a couple years, was it? No, maybe a year and a half ago. Did you guys hear the sound of two black holes? Did you hear when you were at home alone the sound of two black holes colliding? You did? Yeah, it was amazing, right? And those of you who didn't, you should go listen. They recorded two black holes colliding. Um, and so it was this big deal. But then I was sitting next to a physicist um, one evening, not long after I heard the sound of two black holes colliding, and he was really pissed because he said, that is not what two black holes colliding sound like. <laughs> and why didn't they get a musician? It's, it's a metaphor. But in, a, in a sense, so you, you listen to it and you think this is what it sounds like, but in fact they've made a, made a metaphor of sound for what they think it sounds like. So anyway, that has just a little bit to do with this poem, maybe not a ton. It's called Delicately Positioned Mirrors Track the Squeezing and Stretching of Space as Gravitational Waves Go By. Two black holes slid toward each other, making a pig's big nostril holes in the sky. One big snout sniffing out space. Did you hear the rattling antennas? My question is, is it rhythmic? Space and time wrapped around you in a snug, dark glove, and you fell loving out of light, like you fell out of light, or light rushed out of you, 
when a mass 31 times the sun and one 25 times collide, they create a smash hole of 53 solar masses. Okay, speaker, what happened to the other three? I'd say you're missing some. If three equals thee, that is what you hear now hissing, not the fridge's home hum, not the sound of money dashing out and in, but the chirp of ancient space, like gossip sound going sideways across dark skies. Is it rhythmic? It is the breathing in of all living, the exhalation of the dead converted into waves that radiate more energy than all stars. At the uncrisp edge, space twists, divides, and time trembles, scrambles, and leaks like weather. Did you tear yourself out of the visible universe? Yes, one day I did. So this is a book in three parts. In the middle part, you're supposed to cut the book into pieces. Um, and this is my reading copy. I did cut parts of it. And actually, from the pieces you cut, you can assemble a globe. Um, but I'm just going to read from the third section. And I'm just going to read for a few minutes. And when it's time to stop, I'm just going to stop wherever I am. The thing to tell you about this is that it was, I was thinking about Lynn Margulis, and actually a word I first encountered in her work, autopoiesis, which is a word invented by two Chilean biologist thinkers, Varela and Maturana. Um, and it's the notion of how an organism self-produces and self-regulates and as one of the things um, that defines us as living, but it could be a living system too. And so that taken into, um, like Biosphere is a living system, right? And then they visited Biosphere 2, and you may know where we live, that we live on Biosphere 1, which is Earth. And Biosphere 2 was this notion of how to make a place we can live in. Biosphere 1 no longer works. And um, it's rather frightening to know some people close to Trump were involved in Biosphere 2. Anyway, I didn't know that when I visited. So um, these are short little sections. I'll just read until I'm no longer reading, and then we'll go. No one knows how it began. A few atoms lying in the sun began to lick and burn. Then man. Outside her head, a boy ignites the snow with his red shovel. He digs and digs again, making the wingspan grow. There is an easy essay in it, what it means to be live, alive. When the world made its first sounds, the large nerved Meganura flew at the roof of the world. What it means to be gone a gone. First, the wings were two and a half feet wide. Wide. 300 mil million years later, it was a thumb-length dragonfly. Hearing the houses of their small white voices vibrating inside the dome, the crisp tea of the color moving against its walls, as if the tea were a tongue and the walls were its mouth, as if the vowel were a mouth and the world was its mother, the consonants licking the tin clean, as if the tea were a time scrap banging into distant water towers. When I had taken the long way home, I was looking for something. What? I had not lost it, for I had not found it. 
a damselfly, a darner, a truth about how we came to be lying here by the side of the brown river, by the side of the road. You put your right foot into your right shoe because this is what you do to keep your foot from glass and goat weed. This is how to live. I was down in that dark pit when it was completely empty, down in the ditch licking the dark. You can't live in this wind, so climb out of that pit, probing milliseconds for microscopic black holes in the tevatron. Such a thing has yet to be seen in nature, how we came to be non-vanishing masses in the future how we came to be symmetry-breaking rocks, faces. Um, yeah, some crows lost their caw, their predator warning. Their predators were gone. We lost some vowels down in the bowels, the organ chambers where meaning rounds itself out toward night, a light. And I can say about that that I was thinking about the Alala crows, with the Hawaiian crow, which no longer lives. In, it's only in captivity now, and its language base has changed because it no longer has to worry about the hawks that used to predate on it, so it lost the um, word, the crow word, the Alala crow word for hawk. Skipping, skipping. Shurred, aggregates, mineral, iridium, irresidue, smacked us come, smacked us come, the reactor, nuclear, heart atom, oh. Come. Put the originals, namely the animals around us, all the planets back into time, somewhere for sa safekeeping. We had taken them out. First, the animals disappeared, their sounds, then their names. We had forgotten their faces. Their faces are not our faces. So the likeness is to the thing that it is like. I like, like having lions around. Only lions can lie here on this part of other earth. Our last zebra, our last long-fingered frog, our last fruit bat, hypertext transfer, our last angel shark not found. Hypertext transfer not found. Put them in the oracle. Shark, ark, ark. Put them in the leaky coracle. Put the letters in the tin can and rattle them around. Angel sounds like a loud shark. Gathering up the atoms to find a woman who rhymes with time. To find all the letters in the t -er. Read two more sections. They sought to erase from my face all evidence that I had lived. They used needles to do it, extraction methods, and plumping. Ocean makes a slurry sound behind my head, a oh sound. It was silent as the atoms were gathering, then it got noisy. Sound made the ocean make sound, and we found history on the Earth's wrinkled face. Seen a woman who rhymed with time. Does her decay, does her primordial radionuclide dress and its disintegrating daughters do time? 
When you peel off your dead skin to see the face of the world, your all, the already dead go deathly pale. Self is a god we walk through. I was an idiot. It was a mistake. I believe something here. What self? I do not believe the man-made sky. I think like a hero. I think like a dog. I was looking for the real sky. I want more face, more mother, more atoms moving through the heart. Get ready. I am taking man back, or woman, mankind. I'm taking it back for all of us. <laughs> Thank you.